wir sind wunderbar in der Zeit. Bitte kommen Sie. machen weiter mit dem letzten Block unseres ersten Teils der Veranstaltung, nämlich die einzelnen Referentinnen und Referenten zu hören. Und dafür bitte ich die Vertreterin unserer vierten Kooperationspartners für diese Veranstaltung, nämlich des British Council. Dafür bitte ich die Julia Rollins auf die Bühne. Sie wird uns unseren vierten Referenten vorstellen, so von Landsfrau zu Landsmann, vermute ich, wenn es stimmt, nämlich Mr. Mr. Richard Stone, der hier ist, wird jetzt vorgestellt und dann wird ich Sie, Mr. Stone, auf die Bühne. Bitte schön. Danke. So, jetzt kommt der englische Teil. Also ich hoffe, alle haben Kopfhörer. Ja, um, yeah, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. Richard Stone this evening on behalf of the British Council. As the UK's international organization for education and cultural relations, we're delighted to be supporting this event today and to promote a two-way dialogue between the UK and Germany. The British Council's purpose is to build trust and understanding between the UK and other countries, and we do this through the exchange of knowledge and ideas. So we're delighted that Richard Stone is with us to share his experience and his views on institutional racism from a British perspective. So Dr. Richard Stone was on the panels of the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry from 1997 to 1999 and of the David Bennett Inquiry 2003 to 2004 into the death of a black patient in a psychiatric hospital in Norwich. He was pre previously senior partner in a five doctor group practice in central London. He was also vice chair of the Runnymede Trust um, he is president of the Jewish Council for Racial Equality and founder and co-chair of Alif Aleph UK, a group of British Muslims and British Jews. Thanks very much for coming and we look forward to your talk. Good afternoon everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. And Sanim, please could I ask you if I to tell me when I've had 15 minutes of speaking. I'll try and finish uh, another five minutes, so I hope to speak for no longer than 20 minutes. It will leave lots of time for questions and answers, I hope. I'll do my best. I've got lots to say. I have to say that despite what I've decided I was going to tell you when I was in London deciding what I was going to tell you, and so much has come up this, today and this morning and this afternoon. I've got to respond to some of those points as well, but I'll do my best. I particularly wanted to thank, incidentally, the TGD, Ken and Collett's organization, for inviting me. I mean, he was, tells me that it's because he heard me his speaking in Berlin in June that he wanted me to come again. We were talking then at a conference on the uh, NSU and the police at that stage. And then Mekonen also, incidentally, from the... Um, where Mekonen men, who knows, you think I might say it, remembers me as uh, Alaya Yagani. Are you there, Alaya somewhere? Alaya? Alaya Yagani. Oh, she's moved up. Oh, yes, that's right, she's there. Uh, I was here in, in Burton in 19, 2004 uh, uh, at a conference sponsored by the Heinrich Böll Foundation, Stiftung, for, um, on Islamophobia, which is a very courageous thing, I think, for any foundation to do in 2004, have a conference on Islamophobia. So I was very glad that I also got met old friends here as well. Um, we could go through all the other people who have uh, um, sponsored this organization. Particularly, the, I'm glad about the Jewish Museum being represented here as well. That's very important. Um, I remember going there with a, a Muslim woman who represented the British government at an anti-Semitism conference in 2004. She was bowled over by the Jewish Museum. The British Council have been very helpful to me, I must say, in organising, getting me here, actually getting me here and getting me back home again, which has been fantastic. Very important, the British Council. And they've also... Anyway, that's enough for the moment. Let's move into things that really matter. They, friends, this is a very passionate issue. And I get very emotional about these sorts of things. It's a passionate issue. The, the, when you think of the, of the uh, death of Stephen Lawrence, who was murdered by probably five white young men, 
at the, it's in the same year as in 1993, I gather you've got the Soling and uh, also similar problems, people murdered by white people, same sort of problems. 20 years ago, in 1993, Stephen Lawrence was murdered by, five young, was by a gang of five young people. Now, five people are involved in a, in a joint enterprise in a murder. Only they know who actually stabbed him and killed him. We've got rules in British law that all five of them can be responsible for the murder and can be held up for the murder. But 19 years went by before anybody actually was convicted of that murder. It last, it's in this last year, in 2012, we actually sent two people to prison at long last. The parents of Stephen Lawrence, Nora Neville and Dorian Lawrence, are remarkable people. They fought and year yeah, and... Is it, uh, what am I going to do? What's the problem? Oh, you want that out of the way, do you? Of course you do, yes. So sorry. Yes, I'm getting... Oh, there's that better. Ah, so it's getting feedback. I'm getting twice over the translation as well as my voice as well at the same time. For, beg your pardon. My son's here, but he's a bit of a, 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 he's more of a technocrat than I am. I'm a technophobe. The, let me tell you about Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence. They're remarkable people. But there have been a series of m uh, murders of black boys in South East London, let, of which his was the, probably about the third. But the, his, somehow or another, the Stephen Lawrence case grabbed the headlines, probably because they, uh, ten days after the murder, Nelson Mandela came to visit London. And Mr. and Mrs. Mandela were encouraged by <clears throat> some of the leaders of the black organisations in London to, to meet with Mandela. Mandela then had a photograph taken with Mandela and Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence who went hit across all the newspapers in Britain. Mr. Mandela said a terrible thing. <clears throat> he said that it's frightening for me to come to Britain and find in 1993 that the police in Britain, white police in Britain, treat black people <clears throat> the same way that the police used to treat black people in South Africa when we were having the, anti, uh, the South African regime, the apartheid regime. That actually knocked a lot of British people very seriously between the eyes because we felt he was in fact saying that we were as bad as apartheid South Africa in the treatment of black people in our country. It's a terrible indictment of our policing. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Man, um, Lawrence went on saying the police were not trying hard enough to kill they said get the killers of their son. Within four or five days they felt the police were not trying hard enough and they started complaining and complaining and complaining. The police went on for two years saying that everything that could possibly be done has been done. They even had a full review of the actual murder which actually said that everything could be done, wonderful, marvellous review, the police are just wonderful. And yet, in the end, Mr. Mrs. Man, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence got in touch with the Labour government, the new Labour government, in 1996, when the Labour was, Mr. Blair was going to come in in 1997. He got a promise out of the government that if the Labour got in, and if Jack Straw became the Home Secretary, Jack Straw would organise a judicial review, a whole judicial inquiry into the failure of the police in that murder. Now, I was one of the four people who was put onto the panel of that inquiry. The other people, now where are we? That's it, thank you. So you can see there's me at the bottom there. The other advisor was Tom Cook, a former senior detective and a very important man. And jo John Sentiman. John Sentiman was a very interesting man. He was a judge in Uganda under Idi Amin. And he had to flee because I said to him, why, why did you have to go? Why did you have to leave when Idi Amin was there? He said, because he's a black, obviously, and obviously a black, black, black African. He said, oh, he said, because I was locking up all the enemies of, of, of Idi Amin, putting them into prison. I said, what do you mean? You're locking up all the enemies of Idi Amin? He said, yes, to protect them from the army. Huh? Huh? Interesting, then. So he had to flee, and he only just got away with his wife and his life. He came to this country, entered the Church of England. He's now the Archbishop of, Archbishop of York, which is the second in command of the whole of the Church of England in the whole world. Remarkable position for him. He applied for the new job of Archbishop of Canterbury. He just became vacant and didn't get it. Interesting that too. One wonders about things. Well, one of the things you know, on an inquiry, looking back over this inquiry, there are a lot of odd things that happened. And when you pursue the into do, like doing investigative journalism on those oddities, you find some very interesting answers. Anyway, let me move on a little bit. You can see I was also a, a doctor, and if you see what it says about my doctoring, I, it's a little bit of a joke there. If you just leave it on the screen a little bit longer, then. I do want to come very much to institutional racism because we actually were forced by the Commission of Metropolitan Police to def define institutional racism. I argued with the judge, if you get into the definition for institutional racism, people who are in denial don't want to make the change. We'll spend hours, if not weeks, if not years, picking over the words, is this institutional racism? Is that that we'll have a wonderful time picking over the words and not, not actually doing anything. But the Commission of Metropolitan Police went into denial. He said, I will not acknowledge institutional racism exists in my police service even though the previous week the Commissioner of Metropolitan Police in Birmingham 
he, the chief constable in Birmingham, had said, I acknowledge this institutional racism in my police force, and we're going to make the changes. And so we said to him, couldn't you at least accept the view of your colleague a week ago as a precedent? And you were there. No, he couldn't do it. He just couldn't do it. He said, I need a definition which I can show to my officers and to the public that my, all my officers are not racist. It's interesting your point came up this morning. Somebody was saying that not all, it doesn't mean that all your people in, the work, in your organisation are racist. The crucial thing about institutional racism is, thing is this, that the, the rules of policing in Britain are totally race neutral, but it's how you implement them that you get the problems of institutional racism. Let's move on. It hasn't moved. Ah, that's it. You see, I think that people talk about direct racism, and we know what direct racism is, basically. It's racist comments, people show, throw abuse at you, um, or racist assaults. So in other words, you can verbal racism and, and uh, violent racism. We all know what they are about when you have the people use offensive words about Muslims or black people or gypsies, whatever it happens to be. Um, but, and it also means not being selected for a job when white staff with less experience and less qualifications are promoted by white people over black or Asian or Muslim staff. You know the sort of situation, is that clear? But we, I think the, what we're drawing, the difficulty I think comes when you come to indirect racism or a culture of racism, all of which in a way add up to institutional racism, so I'll come to that in just a moment. I mean, when you get to indirect racism, it's when a, an organisation runs in such a way that, for example, nobody thinks to provide a prayer room if there are a significant number of Muslims in the, in the, in the place, and they would like to have it, but when they do ask for it, they're told, well, I'm sorry, we're not going to provide you know, for prayer rooms or facilities for particular minority people who are here. Why should we? But I think it's a courtesy. Um, so that also when people employ Orthodox Jews, I'm not an Orthodox Jew myself, I'm a Reformed Jew, which is slightly different. But when people do need to leave early on a Friday afternoon in order to observe the Sabbath on the home on Friday evenings, then a number of, in the East End of London, for example, where, a lot, where there have been in the past there have been a lot of Jewish organizations, a lot of Jewish businesses in, um, what's it called, uh, Petticoat Lane, that sort of place, then in the, in the times when the Jewish community was there, people would actually close their jobs and close their work on Friday afternoon so the Jewish people could go to their home. It's quite difficult to argue that again nowadays. We have, so many, we have a rather small number of Jews in Britain. So it's these sorts of indirect way, ways in which people can um, affect a group of people. And in, uh, it's if there's an identifiable group of people to, you, to whom you're providing a second-rate service, then that's, in, that's an indirect sort of racism. It's a culture. Let's come to the real nub of it, which is institutional racism. Oh, the, oh, I, I just wanted to say on, on the culture of racism, a good example in the police is, the police for many years in Britain had a height recommend, a minimum, a minimum height. You had to be up to about six foot tall. What is it? I don't know if it's a metre. It's been taller than me anyway, before you could become a police officer. Then we started recruiting a number of people from our Asian communities. Don't forget the Muslims in Britain are nearly all from the Indian subcontinent. 80% of the Muslims in our country are from the Indian subcontinent, Pakistan, Bangladesh and India. So, and uh, the, the heights there are really almost ruled out any, officer, any, any people from that community becoming uh, police officers, which I think is unfortunate. And they were taken to an industrial tribunal in the end on a group, on an indirect racism kind of uh, case. And they were, the case was won, so the police had to abolish the height restriction. And that was terribly important. So you now can have police officers who are shorter than I am. Why not? Um, so then, but that then opened the way to other uh, cases against the police for their restrictions, restrictive practices, such as that people had to wear helmets if you're a police officer in England. You know, with these funny helmets we all have. But what about a man who comes from a Sikh background? He'll only wear a turban. So cases have actually been brought, and then in the end, the precedent was used of the height restrictions then to say that, yes, but that's the case of somebody who should be able to wear a turban if they want to. And they, they were being told, Sikh people were told, you must take your turban off and wear a helmet. But they were not prepared to do that. That ruled them out of the job. So now you see in some parts of England, you'll see police officers who've got turbans with the badge of the police on the front of it. They're navy blue ones. It's wonderful. Then women came along and said, look, I'd like to be in your police force, but I'd wear a hijab. Um, what, what do I have to wear? Do I have to wear yeah, one of your picked caps? So now you'll find women with a, a blue hijab, with little black and white sort of crosses, what are they called, checkered p p patterns around them, with a police badge on the uniform. Not very difficult. So the cases begin to, the thing snowballs, it begins to take off and then people will use, you have to use the law. The law is very helpful. If there's a law, it will change the attitudes of people, actually. In fact, the effect of a law is more to change people's attitudes, in my view, than the actual in practice of the law. 
in the 1960s in Britain, if you were renting out a room for, for, to let for somebody to get a room in your house, people used to put a notice in the window and they could say, no dogs, no Irishmen, no blacks, no Jews. They could say whatever they liked in those notices. Then we passed our first anti-racism law in 1965, I think it was, Race Relations Act, another one in 1976 as well. And these, these sorts of practices were actually outlawed in the law. And the result is actually people that hardly any ever, in fact, very few cases ever came against people for doing that anymore because they just stopped doing it. They stopped doing it because there was a law there. If there's a law there, people often observe the law because they know it's there. It becomes, it changes the culture and attitude of people actually to have a law that tells you what you're doing is wrong. Now, let's take institutional racism. Now, the, what, what happened with the police is Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence, I told you, Mr. and Mr. 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 Mrs. Lawrence, the parents of Stephen Lawrence, knew that when their son had been murdered by a gang of white people, five white boys, they were, a lot of the same five names were handed into the police and to Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence's house as well. And a week later, a few days later, they said to the police, what are you doing with these five names? We're working on very hard on them. We've got more police officers on at this case than any other. But they were not, no, they were quite clear, nothing, they weren't doing anything to follow up the leads. So the Mr. Mrs. Lawrence got more and more angry, more and more angry. And in the end, the police actually had the nerve to blame Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence and their lawyer, who was representing them, for the delays in the, uh, and inefficiencies of the police themselves. They said that they had been bombarded by Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence's lawyer with the demanding of information. And when we, in 1989, five years after the murder, started this judicial inquiry, we found that that bombardment consisted of two letters, three faxes, and four telephone calls, that's all. Clearly, they were not being bombarded at all. They were just covering up for their own inefficiencies. In now, in the same, just rather the same sort of way that uh, the, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence felt the police were not trying hard enough, I sense I may be wrong. I sense that what's happening with the, uh, the uh, NSU and the, uh, the people who have been murdered by the NSU since 2007, I sense that I may be wrong. The, the, you would say that maybe the police didn't try hard enough to find the killers in that same circumstances. Is that what the complaint is about? Did they just not try hard to find the killers? I don't know. No, can anybody answer that? Can any, you're not, Salem is nothing. Thank you much indeed. Somebody's got to answer me. If I ask for questions, I really mean it. I want you to respond if you don't mind. <laughs> if you're asleep, I'm sorry. I'll try to sort of wake you up. So I think that there is big parallels between what we had with our inquiry and what I think the uh, problem with the NSU here is happening here as well. Can I just say instantly that, uh, that I understand that people have a problem with racism and Bishop John Sentamu on my inquiry understood that when he asked the, police, the Commissioner of Metropolitan Police about his reason why he couldn't accept the idea of institutional racism, he, uh, the, he said that I understand you have problems with, with race because after all we're, one, we're all one human race. So I do understand you have got problems but he said we all know what racism means. I feel like it's a narrowing of the term from the human race because we all one way race but they are sort of racism is something that we know what it means it means basically one group often with people in power who are abusing that power against an identifiable group of people often people with less power where does it all come from people ask me I think so who was it was saying was it uh, Mrs. Ludwig was, was it right she, I think she was on touching on the uh, legacy of colonialism in Europe Europe is a very colonial power I think the colonial, history of colonialism and the attitudes that developed uh, reduced the people who were colonised into sort of second-class citizens. I mean, I don't know if any of you have read a book on, on Orientalism. Orientalism is exactly what it's all about. They're different and they're odd and they're uh, people rather sort of rather um, glamorous in a way because they're odd and they're different. But they're definitely inferior. And people would say that, you know, in a way that we white people are much above everybody else, but I don't think so. That's not my experience. Um, so uh, let me just say then that uh, that'll do. Anyway, let's move on to the definition. Anyway. That's what people really want to see. We, as you see at the top of it, in, in our report, we say, we say we grapple with the problem of, its, of defining institutional racism. It's very difficult. The very chapter in, in our report, is of the report of the inquiry five years on, was, uh, the, was the biggest chapter is, in fact, the one on racism. We go right back to 1967, which is when Stokely Carmichael in the United States first coined the terms institutional racism. People say, you, you coined the term institutional racism. I didn't. We didn't do it. It was done by Stokely Carmichael 40 years before. So it's, uh, we, what we did, I think, was put it on the map. So it became part of the public discourse in Britain, institutional racism. So we grappled with how you define it. It's very difficult, quite too, too difficult to do. It's not a complex problem. Anybody who's on the, on the receiving event, end of racism knows perfectly well what it's all about. I mean, racism is not in the head of black people. It's in the head of people who look like me, frankly. 
in the same way, same way that anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are not in the heads of Muslims or but Jews, they're in the heads of people outside those communities. So it's we who are outside those communities who have to make the change. I don't know when the people got, women got the vote in, in Germany, but certainly we got the vote, women got the vote in Britain in 1919. And women would throw, chain themselves to the railings, they even threw themselves in front of the horse of the king, the Derby race course, to, make, uh, to fight the cause, to demonstrate to the public the intensity of the feeling that women should have an equal vote to men. But the women couldn't get the chain, they couldn't do anything themselves, there was a limited amount they could do to, to, to bring the, the problem in, uh, to the to the eyes of the people in Parliament. They had to change the minds of white men because the white men were in Parliament in those days. Men were, men, only men could change the vote, voting system because they were the men of the Parliament. And they got it through. So the point about it is that if women wanted to get the, change and get the vote for themselves, they had to change the minds of men. If black people want to get racism rid of us, I mean, it's not an issue for racism for black people, it's an issue for white people, actually. So I'm glad to see there are some white people here. And the last conference I went to uh, uh, in London a couple of weeks ago on racism, almost everybody in the audience was black. And I felt, I said, where are all the white people? And I got a round of applause for that. Because it was true. If we're going to try to address racism, it's no good speaking to the people who wanted change. It's the people who have got the power to make the change. It's a power relationship. And it's abuse of the power not to do so when people are clamouring at you. And it's an unju obvious injustice if people don't have the vote or they don't care, can't get the jobs they want. I was very taken this morning, incidentally, about the people talking about the first and second generation. In my country, I don't know what it's like here, but my experience of young people who were born and bred in Britain, whose parents made the journey here, or their grandparents made the journey to Britain, into Europe. Their children are fine people. They've, made, they've been ed ed had education in our schools in England. They've faced discrimination in the schools. They've had to use their elbows to find ways around that discrimination in schools, in the first and the primary schools, and the secondary schools. They've faced discrimination in... Uh, in uh, universities and colleges, they've faced discrimination in work. If they get to the glass ceiling above which you can really, you can really get to the big jobs, that's fan they're fantastic people because they've got so much more talent than other people who haven't had to, fa haven't had to develop the sort of tactics those things those people have had to face. I think there's a terrible, a terrible stupidity. Um, Michael Moore, the American, do people know that Michael Moore, the American, makes all these films about terrible things that are happening in America. He talks about stupid white men. One of his films is Stupid White Men. Stupid white men don't waste the talent of good people. When I look around here, the people who've got, come here from minority communities, people who've reversed what I call the reverse colonization of Europe, people who were the colonies have come here and they've come and recolonized us. And they're second, they and their particular second and third generation people, obviously highly talented, very enthusiastic, very keen to contribute to the country. Even first generation, people don't come here to claim benefits. They don't come here because they'd rather not be here. They come here because they want to contribute in some way and do something worthwhile. People who say that they can't, the Turkish people in this country who say to me, they, they're told their Turkish people aren't as bright or they don't want to work, they don't want to, work, they don't want to do proper work. I think they're crazy. the people who believe that, they're wrong. People don't come to Europe usually from outside Europe. Turkey is technically outside Europe. It's a big mis political mistake, I think, to do that, to keep them out. But if people come here from Turkey, they come here usually because they've got a reason for coming here. Well, they, what do they, why do they want to come here? Because they want to get some work. That's what people... And then they go in here and they stay here and they have children. And those children... They're, they're, they're still, uh, they're still, they're still, they're Germans. After all, they've been born and bred here. When that people, there's a famous story in, in Britain, it's rather like your Kevin stories from this morning, which says, Leroy, Leroy is a typical name, if you like, for black people. My, one of my best friends is called Leroy Logan. He's a senior police officer, great guy. But uh, they say, Leroy at school, Leroy, where do you come from? He says, from, from, from London, miss. Ah, oh, but where were you born, Leroy? In London, miss. But where did you come from before that? It's so obviously, it's, it, it's right, it, it's, these are, fun, these are they're funny stories, but they're terrible indictment of the people who, make, who are on the other, on the, uh, who are abusing their power. This woman has got no understanding of those people. And I think the people are missing out on not only the talents, but also I think the sense of fun. I have to say, as a British Jew, I've spent a number of years working very, 25 years I've been working very closely with Muslims, and I find more fun with both British Muslims and British Jews meeting together. You have to be very careful not to be anti-Christian, you understand, of course, but I mean, well, get around that one. We do have a few jokes I have to tell you between us, but I won't tell you about those till later. But, um, no, but it's, it's really a very dynamic relationship. I mean, Muslims and Jews have had their golden ages living together. What are we doing fighting each other in Europe? In the north, where we are in the north cross, northwest corner of Europe, we've all washed up here for all sorts of interesting reasons. My grandfather came here in the 1880s, and I can tell you the story of that too. It's a good story. And my friend whose father came here too from... Uh, from Pakistan at the time of partition, where the, uh, Britain left 
India and to rot, knowing there was going to be real divisions there. But we hadn't had no power left after the end of the Second World War. We'd used up all our, all our, our, our men. You know, we had no power at all to control anybody anymore. Had to give up the empire. So when we talk about, we have got so much we can talk about. We've got similar sort of kind of religious backgrounds. We've got so much in common. People quickly get off on the religions and other things. We've got to move on to other things, my wife says. She's got a killer thing in there. Definition, yes. So I'll just come to this definition, and I won't, I'll focus on a few of these things. First of all, it's a collective failure. The police in the Stephen Lawrence investi murder investigation, they, um, they, 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 all the decisions they should have made were wrong. Or, if they, or they didn't even make the decision at all. If they, and if they did, whatever they did, they, did, they didn't take any notes. Or if they did take notes, they lost them. It was quite incredible. You could say to them, well, what did, one officer says to me, um, uh, I, I, I came down and I saw, uh, uh, I, 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 briefed my, I told my officers about what had happened. I gave, got them to go searching right away. This man called Inspector Groves, the first senior officer is an inspector, he comes to the state, to the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, and he says to he, he was told that he, that he briefed his officers that there'd been a fight between two young black men. There'd never been a fight between two young black, black, black men. In fact, what we know from the, if he'd only asked, stopped, stopped to ask the officer who was standing, you know, where you have a scene of crime, they were all taped off, and the officer standing around that, guarding that, all the evidence there, she'd actually interviewed uh, the friend of Stephen Lawrence, Duane Brooks, who told her there'd been a group, a group of five people who had attacked him. And they'd run up, off, up, run up, run off up Dixon Road there. This, this inspector comes with 40 police officers and three police vans. He tells us there's been a fight between two people. They've got to go out and look for evidence of a fight. There's never any evidence of a fight. They look, so he set them off to find the wrong information. Because he had assumed that there were two black boys equals a fight between two black boys. It never occurred to him that there might actually be two black boys who were actually victims. One of them actually got stabbed and the other one didn't just did manage to, manage to escape with his own life. Then he took his sergeant he went off to the local pub up the road to ask if anybody heard any, any sort of any noise from a fight. It wasted, a complete waste of time with those 40 police officers. Terribly unprofessional work that man had done. Quite unbelievable how unprofessional he could have been. So that's the collective, it was a collective failure and it really was a huge failure, all the way, even right up to the commissioner himself. Because he also, he did things to which he associated himself with that unprofessionalism. He was saying, apologising to them that they that the, the, uh, the, when we cross-questioned cross him, he had to apologise to the, the, the Lawrence's that he got it wrong. He had to apologise for not apologising before and reassuring them for five years that he'd done some marvellous work with the police officers, and yet they'd obviously done made a complete matter of the shambles of it all. It's unbelievable. It's, it's, an appropriate, it's um, a collective failure of an organisation to provide an appropriate and professional service. Very important, appropriate and professional. It's a very good guidelines. If you're not sure whether something is appropriate or if it's institutional racism, just ask yourself, is it appropriate and professional to do that? I mean, I discriminated against some of my patients who were Bangladeshi families, homeless families, and I got irritated with them because they kept coming in without appointments like everybody else did. But they couldn't do that because they had no... They, had, they weren't registered. It was terrible. They, were, they, should, they were living in the hotels. And I was clearly trying to get them out because I had patients with appointments. And I was getting it. But I had no right to do that because they need special. They had more needs than my ordinary patients. So I had to then spend less time with some of my ordinary patients who were on my list and more time with them. Find ways to do that. And then I felt better at night because I was sleeping in bed better at night because I'd actually given a properly professional, special professional um, uh, course of action for the patients who most needed my care. They needed more time, not less. It can be seen or heard, or it be because of their colour, cultural, ethnic origin, and straightforward. It can be seen and detected in processes, attitudes, and behaviour, which amount to discrimination through unwitting prejudice. That's important. Ignorance, thoughtlessness, and most important, racist stereotyping. I said to the judge one morning, it's all very well putting in unwitting prejudice. But I think that's terrible. People, some of the police's officers, sometimes they know what they're doing. They're witting, if you like. There's no such word in the English language. But if they knew what they were doing, they knew what they were doing. He said, I think you're right, but on the other hand, he said, he said to me, look, yesterday you wanted racist stereotyping, I want unwitting prejudice today. So I said, so, oh, well, I, that was it. So we've got unwitting prejudice, which I don't think I'm happy with, but I'm very happy with racist stereotyping. I get attacked by people when I have a speak in public in England. Black people in the audience say, but what's this always unwitting prejudice? They know what they're doing. And then I told them this story about the, bar the barter but with the judge in order to get, actually get racist stereotyping in. He said, you're quite right. And they, 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 they accept that having one noting prejudice is actually a reasonable co compromise because racist stereotyping is so important. We've heard about stereotyping this morning. 
And it's really, that man, Inspector Groves, is a typical example of stereotyping. How am I doing for time? Sonim, how am I doing for time? How much have I had so far? Five more minutes? Okay, I'll try and come to the, come to the point a little bit more. And the, but the ultimate thing of all this thing is, it, it, whatever happens, it, it, it ends up disadvantaging minority ethnic people. That's black people in our, we, it's a euphemism we use for, minor, for black people. So, if we're just, that'll do, I think, from there. We'll leave that for the moment. Now, I think what we've got to do is in, enough of this business sort of, um, uh, oh, we've, you know, we've done wonderful things in the police or any other service. We've done wonderful things to change things. Oh, no, you haven't. Oh, yes, we have. Oh, no, we haven't. That sort of business. So that's, that's a waste of time. I think what we have to do is to seek out examples of people who actually did it, where they've done it. I've been about four or five I've done, in that, which I put into a report in 10 years on, of where, to, where people have made the change. And then we need to use those examples to, to get other people to do it as well. If, if one police officer in Birmingham could have connected with his minority communities in such a way that he actually operated when he had to do a, a, an arrest for um, suspected terrorists. Instead of doing the usual dawn raid of taping off and uh, emptying the families out, coming in with, with armed police, he asked his independent, uh, some people from the communities, he said to them, uh, what do I have to do to arrest these people? He said, don't do all the usual business. It creates huge animosity, animosity amongst the animosity amongst Muslim communities, our local communities. Just do, do us a favour, tell us the names of the families. So he told them the names of the families. He said, you won't tell anybody. Of course, they wouldn't tell anybody, and they didn't. Then he says, um, uh, what do you advise we do then? And he said, well, what are the, do we know those families you mentioned. Do you, which of the children are doing it? And he, said, and he gave the name of the two young men, and they said, well, we know those, men, those boys anyway. Our advice to you is, that, therefore, just to put a police, uniformed police officer outside their front door and arrest them as they would go out to work in the morning, which they did. And the result was that there was publicity was two lines in the local and national newspapers which said and two arrests have been made for terrorism in this part of Birmingham. And that was it. No fuss, nothing at all. The word got round the Muslim communities very, very quickly. They then, as a result of what they found from these two young men, they had to increase the stop and search. You know about stop and search? You know, people who could stop and search people, uh, ordinary citizens, police can do that. They increased the stop and search, and that nearly always ends up in trust and confidence in the police going down. This time, they did, as a result of the stop, increasing stop and search, actually the trust and confidence went up. It was a measurable outcome that showed that his, his trust of the local Muslim communities, treating them as proper equal citizens rather than as inferior people, worked crucially important. So that's one of my favourite stories I have to tell you, if it was happened, as a result of defining institutional racism and people working on it. So I think what are we going to do? That's one of the things you can do. We'll see. Yes, this is the most important thing of all. I think you have to work out, try and find, if you want to do something about all this, you have to find measurable outcomes that will measure what people are actually doing. And I think the obvious place people think always is that what, what's, how do we serve our public? And we, in Britain, we are actually monitoring stop and search, how many stops and search, and we're monitoring it by racial profiling as well. And what worries me immensely doing racial profiling. It's very similar to what the Nazis did to the Jews. Obviously, so as a Jew, as I feel very concerned about it. But also, I think it's very un offensive to many black and Asian people in our country as well, to be a profile. But on the other hand, it does provide the information that you can compare the disparities in stop and search in one area to compare to the number of people in the population. So we can say that in an area where there are 20% of, of Muslim or, Jew or black people, and we're stopping 40% of black and Asian kids, that's obviously wrong. But if there are 20% of young pe people in the community of that, and we're stopping the same amount of people, that's not too bad. But the disparities are terrible. Because in England, we find, in Britain, for years, we've been, been able to measure that in 1999, at the end of our inquiry, you were four to six times more likely to be stopped by the police if you're black than white. By the time 10 years had gone on, unfortunately, it doubled. By that time, it had become four, 12, what is eight, eight to 12 times. I'm told now, in this present year, in 12, 2012, the statistics are showing 21 times more likely to be stopped if you're black than white. There's a famous time in London where we had some London bombings. The Irish were bombed, threw a bomb at the Bank of England. It caused devastation. And then the police put an, a, a ring of steel around, what they call a ring of steel around London. Everybody going, coming into the centre of London, to the city of London, they had to be stopped by the police and they could be checked, and particularly motor cars and vans. And when they mentioned, they mentioned the disparate disparities, four to five times more likely to be stopped if you're a black driver than if you're a white driver. And how many, how many black Irish terrorists are there? So I mean, it's ludicrous, you say, but these ludicrous things, they matter very much. 
it's quite clear that I'm afraid the police officers are very often stopping people just because they're black. There's a well-known offence in New York, I'm told, about being stopped, be it, stopped while being black. Not being stopped while being, you know, a threat or anything. Like, stopped while being black. A young man told me in London, he got off the bus at three, 2 o'clock in the morning because he'd been to his uncle's birthday party. And he was just walking across the road into his estate and he was stopped by four police officers. And he said, because he was a bright spark, he knew that he could ask for a reason. They said, oh, well, there's been a burglary locally of a black guy and the, you answered you answer the description. So he says, uh, really? Tell me, what was that? He said, oh, you mean there's a black guy? He said, clothes as well. He said, just right. So you mean there's a black guy who's done a robbery at two o'clock in the morning wearing a bright yellow tracksuit? Well, that's ludicrous, isn't it? Who does a robbery in a bright yellow tracksuit? Clearly, they just stopped him to have a bit of fun. Another young black man told me last week, he said to me, he said, Dr Stone, when they stop me, stopping me all the time, they know, they, they, none of them know me, because they've often stopped me several times before, and they know I'm always clean every time they stop me. And yet, he says, um, they're stopping me, uh, I've lost the track of the story, help. I've lost the figure, why don't they stop me? Let's come back, maybe I'll come back then another time. <laughs> I think we, sorry, but I just do want to make... Oh, right. just want to say employment. Don't forget that in employment is a good measure of, probably a better measure than anything else, of uh, your uh, capacity to be open towards people from minority backgrounds and your capacity for delivering a service which is relevant. But, I, mean, I said, mentioned this, this, this senior police officer called Leroy Logan, who's so good that I actually put him on my farm, family's grant making charitable trust, a very good, very, very wonderful, good man. He took the employment tribunal to the police and employment tribunal and he won. And he got one of his, and his result of which he won six figures, figures in under, over a hundred thousand pounds, and he won. But the point is that he got to the glass ceiling, where they could actually go up to become a commander, and that's really the senior police officers with two levels of yellow stuff on the, you know, on the picks of their caps. And uh, but he he knew that he could he would get passed over, and he got passed over that level and passed over again. Now he's decided to leave the force. He can't stand it any longer. They've lost a really bright, really smart, very highly professional police officer. Because he knew and they knew that he knew that people were being promoted above his head. They were getting the command course, who were, which he got more experience and more qualifications than they had, and yet he was being passed over. Really disgraceful waste of talent. The waste of talent is any country that wastes talent, like this for the scale, is doomed to disaster. And I hope Germany won't come to the level of economics that we've got in Britain soon. Thank you much indeed. <laughs> Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank. Wir haben jetzt auch Zeit, nochmal Nachfragen hier anzunehmen. Ich möchte die Definition des institutionellen Rassismus, haben wir hier in der PowerPoint eben auch schon gesehen, so wie er in dem MacPerson Report niedergelegt wurde, den Kernsatz nochmal hier deutlich wiederholen. Die Definition lautet, institutioneller Rassismus wird definiert als kollektive Versagen einer Organisation, angemessene und professionelle Dienstleistungen für Personen wegen ihrer Hautfarbe, Kultur oder ethnischen Herkunft anzubieten. Und dann gibt es noch eine nähere Erläuterung, dass dies auch in verschiedenen Formen geschehen kann, nämlich in Entwicklungen gesehen oder festgestellt werden kann. Abwertende Einstellungen und Handlungsweisen tragen zur Diskriminierung und der Benachteiligung angehöriger ethnischer Minderheiten bei. Aber die Kernaussage ist klar, dass nicht angemessene professionelle Dienstleistungen aufgrund dieser Merkmale angeboten werden. Das scheint mir am heutigen Tag eine sehr klare Definition zu sein. Wir suchen ja seit mehreren Stunden nach einem Begriff. Äh, Mr. Stone, Sie haben zweimal wiederholt, dass es Ihnen wichtig ist, messbare Kriterien zu formulieren. Ähm, ja, mir scheint... Alles wieder da. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't like to provide the cabaret. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Mir scheint, dass auch diese Definition von institutioneller für die institutionelle ähm, Rassismus doch sehr handfest ist, sehr konkret ist. Angemessene professionelle Dienstleistung, das kann man messen. Da gibt es ja Kriterien für. Was ist denn Ihre Erfahrung? Mit dieser Definition kann die schon irgendwo praktisch Anwendung finden? Yes, of course it does, because it means that when people do 
at, do the sort of acts about if we can find the police officers like, like the man who stopped that young chap in the yellow tracksuit. If we can monitor that and start to monitor the stop and search. We, one of our recommendations was um, to recommendation 61, incidentally, was that that uh, when, when any police officer stops anybody, you should have to give a, a little record of the stop, that's all. And a little slip of paper that's no bigger than that, which has the name of the person who you stopped, the number of the police officer on his, on his, his number so you can identify him or her, and also the self-identified uh, ethnic group that you come from. I can say I'm black or white or whatever it is I want to say, or Asian or whatever it is, or whatever, or any mixture or anything like that, but anyway, self-identified. And then, uh, and also the time and where it was. And the reason, now, the crucial about it, they have to put the reason down. The officer has to put the reason in. Now, that, you don't, that then goes back to the central station. So if anybody wants to analyse, what, if I'm a sergeant of police and I'm stopping people, they can then analyse, if they want to, how many, what sort of proportion of black people that I'm stopping. So it gives you data you can actually use. Unfortunately, what happened to that was, was that um, within a year, the police were piloting a new form and instead of having what I found, it would take about 36 seconds normally to fill in, they had two sides of A4 paper for a huge, great big long questionnaire, which obviously clearly, grossly undermined the whole idea of a simple thing. Because then the police officer said, I don't have time to give to you all this monitoring business, it's a waste of time, I can't do that sort of thing, you know, we've got to get on with real policing. This concept of real policing, they keep talking about real policing, that means, in other words, leave us alone to go on discriminating the way we've done for 50 years, 100 years in this country. So they, on the other hand, we are they're in London, They've decided that, first of all, they don't. First of all, there's a decision they're not going to do any of these monitoring anymore. It's too difficult. On the other hand, where they are doing it, they're doing it properly with a small piece of paper, which I think is brilliant. So we may actually be able to start using it properly. Any other ones? Any other thoughts? Bitte mm schön. -hmm. Bitte. I'll speak in English. So. You're very kind, thank you, yeah. which I appreciate. Yeah. I do apologise for not speaking German, I'm sorry. <laughs> French, but not a little bit of Russian, but no... No, no but I, I, I personally, listening to your uh, you know, uh, report was for me a little bit of a time loop because I was actually there in 19, uh, from 1995 to 2001 during the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, and uh, I studied film. And one of the reasons I decided to study film in the UK was because I was in my own city attacked at not far from here in Friedrichstraße Where? overnight what city? Uh, by some hooligans uh, at night. So mm -hmm. I decided maybe Berlin post-war unification trauma is not the right place for me. So I went to the UK, studied there and uh, I remember very clearly the time during the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, there was a lot of demonstrations and pro protests and um, we, as black film students at that time, were very much empowered by what was going on. We thought Britain was like, you know, moving ahead, Getting there, setting an example, yes. you know, doing something. Maybe Europe can lead. And then you, you just told me that it took until this year or last year that the true arrests were made of the, you know, suspects yeah. that, that attacked the two boys. And... Now we have our own traumatic ev event in, in, you know, in Germany. So how is that for you? How do you feel that your work, how, how have you felt your contribution has changed British society and, and, and your impact in maybe defining institutional racism has set an example? Because I remember we, we were very much optimistic during that time in 2000 that now British society is open up, is, is changing things. And uh, my graduation film at that time was about police and death. Uh, I mean, death and police custody about a black young Muslim boy that loses his father. In, in, and I remember that the, the director of the school said this is too taboo we can't do that i'm gonna get trouble with so he was he was afraid that in my graduation film I'm, I'm talking about that subject do you think now after the london riots that your work has made an impact that did you have or the inquiry and what you have done has changed something well i must say i rather imagined after this huge inquiry i might say the publicity for this inquiry every day there's new revelations about the incompetence of the police and the terrible attitudes of the police towards black people it, the headlines all over the place, day, day after day on television and radio for nearly six months of our hearings, 
quite amazing. And it went on for the next year or two. And it still hits. The funny thing about it is the police officers who are in denial, senior police officers in particular, if they're in denial, then they, they, they just find it explodes in their faces. It's an issue that never goes away. So I think you're, I rather hope that, you know, imagine after all that huge amount of effort and that tremendous amount of quite stressful stuff within the inquiry, and within a wee year or so, things will be much, much better. Uh, but I think that uh, it hasn't been much as much better as I wanted. In fact, I'm really quite devastated now, what, 14 years on, that still the, 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 there's a sense in which the police, I think, still have the attitudes haven't changed. What they've done is they've just swept a lot of it into the carpet. The uh, uh, wild racism that I drew me in in the first place when they beat up young black kids and got away with it, you know, that's almost finished now. Although, interestingly, in the last six months, there have been 12 officers who have suddenly been caught beating up young black kids like they used to in the 1970s when I first got drawn into the anti-racism struggle. But on the other hand, this time, when I wrote to the Metropolitan Police Commissioner about it, he said, yes, but six of those were actually outed by their, their colleagues at work for doing it. So if you like, there is a culture growing into the police, which is terribly important, that people realise when somebody does anything racist, that actually that is unacceptable behaviour to the point that they're prepared to risk their, their, their colleagues giving them hell for you know, not standing together side by shoulder to shoulder like the police always feel they have to do and actually outing their, their friends for doing things wrong. But I agree with you. It didn't take a long, at least anything like, much longer than I thought. I think that one of the most important things about the Stephen Lawrence inquiry is the way that Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence's courage and their sort of stature, if you like, which has grown enormously, that it's really educated the whole of Britain, Britain from whatever country, whatever area you come from, whatever background you are, the, the, about the black experience in Britain, what it's like to be a minority in Britain, which is a also very important. It's changed attitudes towards black people. So I think that it's much more acceptable now for black people to put their heads above the parrots, parapets and prepare to talk about racism. So that's been a very important result of the inquiry. But as for changes, a few of our changes have actually gone through the law, particularly the one on double jeopardy, which is we have a law, and I believe you have it in Germany as well, which is that once you've been, um, uh, what do you call it, um, you've been tried and do not convicted on it uh, and um, found not guilty, you can't be tried for that again to protect the subject from lots and lots of trials until the, 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 law, the state, if you like, can get the result they want. You can't have that. Well, we decided we have to say, because of new DNA evidence possibilities, we reckon we had to overturn that in very careful circumstances. We produced a recommendation that consideration be given to the possibility of changing that law in the face of new evidence and uh, uh, hard evidence, going to be very firm evidence, then it's reasonable. Because otherwise, in fact, one of these guys who actually was um, um, acquitted of the murder due to lack of evidence, because the police hadn't tried hard enough to get it. We felt there may be some, they may get something in the future, sometimes some, some sort of uh, DNA evidence against him. And in fact, they did. And as you say, a year ago, it was in, in April of 2012, two young men were, in fact, were not so many young men, they're 36 years old now, they were 17 at the time. They were actually convicted of the murder. And, um, but on the other hand, one of them had been acquitted and could, should very, technically not have been, uh, he, he must have come away from that Quittled. No, he's never going to be, never be charged again. He's free, free, free of the burden ever. But in fact, our recommendation was referred to the Law Commission. It was enacted as a Parliament Act of Parliament in 2003. And actually, under that new Act, which says he can, in the face of firm new evidence, and it's new evidence as well, then it's possible to, for him to uh, uh, apply, uh, for the police to apply, apply for uh, prosecution. And also, but he has to have a right of appeal to the High Court and to the Court of Appeal as well. So he went through the whole of that process, which took a whole year, in which case, in time, he was in prison waiting. And then he got charged, and he and one of the people who hadn't been acquitted, the two of them have now been convicted of the murder. So that's one great success, but it's not to do with racism in a way, it's to do with something that's wrong with the law. I can't tell you the amount of, uh, huge amount of attack we got for that, mm. that recommendation, but in the end, uh, there was no fuss about it when that guy got actually got convicted. Next, please. Mr. Stone, ich verstehe schon, dass Sie sehr in den Winkelzügen und Ecken der juristischen Vorgaben natürlich auch äh, schlimme Fallen lauern, die zu Ungerechtigkeit führen. Ich glaube, das ist uns hier in Deutschland auch nicht unbekannt. Trotzdem möchte ich appellieren, äh, weitere Fragen zu stellen, die wir in die Diskussionsrunde dann noch mit reinnehmen können. Ich ähm, will Ihnen Mut machen. Legen Sie los, bitte schön. For me, it would be important to also um, get a definition for structural racism because so far for me it didn't get obvious in how far institutional racism and structural ra racism can be distinguished from, from each other. 
I don't know what structural racism is. Oddly enough, it's not a term that I use. Okay. So when I, I heard it being used this morning, I thought I'm going to ask some of your professors yeah, maybe what you're, I see. Sorry, maybe you're the wrong one to ask, but maybe we can um, discuss it later. Yes, I'm so sorry, but I don't, I don't, I don't, it's, not, it's not in part of our literature as far as I know. Yeah, but the conference today... Um, das können wir auf jeden title. Fall mit uh, aufs Podium, nicht yeah, wahr? Das that's why I'm asking. If you're staying afterwards for the buffet, are you? Yeah, you perhaps I Perhaps you can educate me. Thank you. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah I don't know either. I don't know either, so, <laughs> okay. Ja, Salim. bitte, es waren weitere, bitte. Salim. Thank you, Doctor. I, I have three comments. First comment, I fully agree with you. It's the law. Only the law will change things. And it, I, don't, I don't think it will come from the top. It should come from the bottom. We should organize ourselves the way in the civil rights movements the blacks organize themselves, with the Jews, by the way. And that's my second comment. Unfortunately, in Europe, I am very, very glad. I thank you very much for seeing the Jewish-Muslim common struggle. Unfortunately, in France, in Germany, I'm familiar with both. We have been working against each other, very strongly working with each other, And thank God in Germany it's not the case anymore for a year now. I would say for a year. Delighted to hear it. Thank you. Uh, the third, you know, we have disagreements. I am for Palestine. You might be for Israel. But this is not an issue in Europe. We have common struggle in Europe as minorities, not because you are Jewish and because you are Muslim, but because we are Muslim minorities and we have to come into the main society. That's all I want. I forgot to say because I'm very emotional. I Can I just say, instead, I don't want to touch on Israel-Palestine except to say that, in my view, I'm pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli. Um, and, 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 to, and to the wrongs of e either government. I can't do, say, attack one side without attacking the other side. I think you're right, incidentally, about the, the black struggle. The black struggle is absolutely great, but it's, it's still you've got to get people on your side. From, it must be a struggle that doesn't exclude me. So many of the black organizations I feel I would like to have an honorary membership of, you know, then I'll be part of your struggle. Otherwise, I'm not really part of your struggle. I'm on my own. I mean, I think that the business in Mandela, I'm thinking to myself, if, if the Mandela visit, no doubt about it, used, shot the whole issue right up the top of the agenda in this country. So who, I'm telling you who, if, I think the next, if you can, the black organizations and any, any anti-racist organization from any background can plan that the next time that President Obama comes to Germany, should be already organized, the links must be there, ready to say to him, will you be, meet with some of the people, the victims of the parents of the victims or the relatives of the victims from 2007. I mean, if you can actually have that ready, so he can actually do that. It's possible that might actually give you a lot more credibility. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think that's about it for what I can comment. But thank you very much, Salim, for what you say. I agree with you entirely. Muslims and Jews, we've got to work together. But if people want to stop us working together, they have to import the Israel-Palestine thing to divide us. Crazy. Thank you. Den Satz merken wir uns. Pro-Palästina, pro-Israel in einem Atemzug, das halten wir fest als äh, einen wichtigen Satz des heutigen Abends. Ähm, ein Punkt ist nur bei Ihnen in Ihrem Vortrag vorgekommen. Sie haben das erste Mal über Macht gesprochen und Sie haben gesagt, wenn wir über institutionellen Rassismus sprechen und den auch beseitigen wollen, dann müssen wir mit denen, die mächtig sind und diese Ausgrenzung umsetzen können, weil sie an der Macht sind, mit denen müssen wir verhandeln sozusagen. Wir können ja nicht an denen vorbei, die die Macht in ihren Händen halten, eine Lösung finden. Und an dem Punkt gibt es ja unterschiedliche Sichtweisen. Die einen sagen, nö, genau eben nicht mit Vertretern der Mehrheitsgesellschaft, kontra. Die anderen sagen, ja, doch mitgehen werden, von denen wiederum beschuldigt, als zu soft mit den Tätern sozusagen umzugehen. Was ist Ihre Position dazu? Ich habe einen Freund von mir, der Natalie Stewart, die eine schwarze Frau aus dem Karibien ist. Sie ist eine fiercere Frau. And she says to police officers, senior police officers, she's got them frightened, really frightened. She phones up and says, I want to see, me, see the Commissioner of Metropolitan Police. Who is that, Natalie? Yeah, right, 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 next week, you know. I try and get an appointment. It takes me three months to get an appointment with the Commissioner of Metropolitan Police. Natalie Stewart says to police officers, look, it's all very well, but this equality business is not negotiable. He says, so you've just got to do it. You've got to change, you know. And I haven't got the courage to say that sometimes, but she does. She's remarkable. I think we need to remind people there are certain things that are non-negotiable. Justice is non-negotiable, absolutely justice. And also the, pure, the business case for, as I said to you before, about wasting talent. 
It's not negotiable. If we're going to, we've got to tell people that's enough now. Somebody said this morning quite rightly, I think it was you were saying, or somebody was saying, saying it's, it's enough of all this discussion, just stop doing these sorts of things. Let's do the right thing. We, if we know in our bones we're doing the wrong thing, most people know they're doing the wrong thing. Let's do, stop doing the wrong thing. Start doing the right thing all the time. Just have, have the, and leadership is terribly important. That's one of the biggest problems is leadership, sustained leadership. Now, um, when the, just when the uh, Commission for Metropolitan Police had said he would not acknowledge institutional racism without a definition, I think what he was saying to his officers and to the public, he said he wouldn't do this because he thought the, the public and his officers would not understand and they would think that I'm saying that all my officers are racist. But we told him that I think people have learned, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence had actually taught the country, I think, that institutional racism is to do with the institution, the way the institution op operates to the disadvantages of black and ethnic minority people. So I think that uh, it, it's, it's, we all know now what needs to be done. But the leadership of the Metropolitan Police, he was really saying to his police officers, don't worry about this, I'll, I'll, I'll get them to pick over the words and you get on with the real policing, you see. I think that's what he was actually saying to his officers. I thought he was leading a very weak leader by not acknowledging institutional racism. Now I realise he was a very strong leader, but he was leading not forwards but backwards. So I think that what we can do now is I think we must work together. Very much so. And uh, that'll do for the moment, I Silence. Bitte schön. Hier. Mr. Stone, you were quite outspoken in June already when you came for the Bündnis uh, gegen das Schweigen. Can you give us some, some of your moral advice on how we can bring the alliances more together, how we can bring the white, the black, the people of color alliances more into one row to fight for what we want instead of against each other? Thank you for reminding me. That's another point I wanted to bring today. Quite right. I was shocked at this meeting because all the number of the black people present decided that for reasons I couldn't follow because it was all in rather intense German and there's a lot of shouting going on. The black people walked out of the conference. I was quite shocked. That it, for, we must recognize that, of course, we have differences. You could say some, some Jews and some Muslims have fall out over Israel, Palestine, but it's not to do with us here. But nonetheless, it happens. So we, we've all, I think there's a sort of a sense, I think the new politics is not so much party, 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 party politics, it's one issue politics. A lot of people are getting involved politically, but it's on issues of climate change or green issues or, um, uh, or racism, whatever it happens to be. But we've got to recognize we've all got interests in common so that anti-racists may well have some ways of dealing with people in denial that my daughter, the climate change warrior, she finds with people who are dealing with denial in, anti in, in the, the uh, green agenda. And she, she says, for example, she says we get asked the wrong sort of questions shouldn't answer those sort of questions. What's the wrong sort of question? She says, well, people ask us again and again, and we get sucked into the conversations about, are human beings actually responsible for climate change? It's the wrong question. Well, regardless of whether we're responsible, whether we cause it, we can actually do something about it. The right question is, what can we be doing now to reduce the, the, the way the climate is moving? Not whether or not human beings are re relevant. Same way with racism. We can ask the wrong sorts of questions. Well, is this institutional racism or is that? No, that's not the question. The question is, you know really what you're doing. And tell me when you and basically we all have to just address it and work, work together. So I think there are lessons we can learn from each other across the board. The sort of divisions within the anti racism movement, anti Semitism, is part of racism. I'll tell you one very interesting example. I was on a commission called a Commission on British Muslims and Islamophobia in 1996 1997, at the time of the Iraq War, just after the first Iraq War, George W. Bush, the senior. At that time, in Bradford, in north of England, where large Muslim communities are, the, uh, the Rate, uh, rate of anti-racist uh, racist attacks doubled during that time. So the spillover from Iraq into here doubled. Uh, so the racists started attacking people. But they didn't care what, whether, you look, whether you're actually a Muslim or not. The first person actually to be attacked was, in fact, a Sikh who wore a burden, a turban, and was thought, therefore thought must be res responsible for the Muslim activities, so-called the Muslim activities of Iraq. For, but, I mean, Saddam Hussein wasn't much of a Muslim anyway. I understand it. But, I mean, the idea that the first person actually to die was, in fact, a Sikh in America who actually got killed. So, I mean, the, the, in the, the point about what was the Bradford chief of police said, in the eyes of the racist, he doesn't distinguish between black, Asian, Muslim, Jewish, or anybody. He just goes for people who are other. Now, we who are other should be working with the people who are in the majority and the people in the good people in the majority communities, of which there are many, many people. We need to be involving us all in our own struggles. I think I should, we should all have an honorary membership of each other's struggles. So we have people who actually know what we're thinking about can help us to think about what we're thinking about. So I think what you were, mm -hmm. the sort of want to, want to say that sort of thing, is that right? We must unite. United we stand, but believe me, divided we do fall. We really do, seriously.
So I urge anybody, if you suddenly find somebody in your own struggle that's actually dividing it, you realise divisions are the en enemy of all anti-racism and all, all struggles, actually. Division destroys the, the uh, climate change things as, well as much as us. Let's at least work together, all of us together, begin to start unifying the, the struggles we all have against people in power and get some of our people into power too. I mean, you've got 55 members of the Bundestag. We've got about, what, one Green member of Parliament in our system? Crazy. Mr. Stone. Wir werden gleich hier zusammen auf dem Podium sitzen, um zu gucken, wie wir unsere Kräfte zusammenbündeln. Und vorher wollen wir uns noch stärken. Ich glaube, es gibt noch mal Wasser, Kaffee, die Gastgeber wissen es besser. Und ich würde Sie jetzt hier einfach mal abrupt unterbrechen, im Wissen, dass wir gleich wieder weiter diskutieren werden. An der Stelle würde ich auch gerne anknüpfen wollen, wie können wir gemeinsam was tun. Bitte schön, stärken Sie sich und kommen Sie wieder zurück aufs Podium. Dann zum Podium. Dankeschön erstmal. Vielen Dank.